your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value yeah. than you take in payment. The bigger the out or back door you give someone to take, the less they feel the need yeah. to take it. Your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. One thing we all have to realize is that most prospects you talk to don't even know they have a problem. So wh wherever you're at today, I want you to stop what you're doing, okay? And I want you to really think about, so if you're driving down the road and you've got a sales call, you're about to call on a prospect, I want you to listen in. If you're picking up a phone right now to call your next prospect, if you're in the gym today wondering about how your day's gonna go, like your appointments that you have, or maybe you're walking into a board meeting later today to finalize the deal. Heck, right now, maybe you're on a Zoom meeting finalizing that deal instead of a board meeting. I want you to stop and think about this question and think about it deeply. Have you ever wondered, not even talked about, but just wondered, what does it actually take? What does it take to be a top 1% salesperson in your industry? The salesperson who makes all of the money who gets any promotion they want. In fact, they turn down promotions they don't want. They have all the respect of management and the owners in that company. That salesperson, you know what I'm talking about. Well, my next guest is gonna help answer that question for you. Let me give you a small taste of his background. My guest is a highly sought after speaker at company sales conferences and he shares the platform with everyone from today's business leaders and broadcast personalities to even a former US president. We're gonna to have to ask you about that. He's the author of a number of books on sales, marketing influence with total book sales of well over a million copies. Well done. His, his book, The Go-Giver, co-authored with John David Mann itself has sold over 950,000 copies. That's big. And it's been translated into 29 different languages. And the book he was first known for, his endless referrals, Network Your Everyday Contacts into Sales, is considered by many a sales classic, which has sold over 300,000 copies. And today is credited by many top sales professionals to be the book which they built their business success and sales success around. He is an advocate, support supporter and defender of the free enterprise system, believing that the amount of money one makes is directly proportional to how many people they serve. And he's also an unapologetic animal fanatic. Well done. And he's a past member of the board of directors of Furry Friends Adoption Clinic and Ranch in his town of Jupiter, Florida. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Bob Berg. Bob, how are you? Wow, what a nice introduction, Jeremy. Thanks so much for having me on. Enjoying, enjoying that nice sun out there in Florida? Oh, absolutely. Sunny and warm. You know, I grew up in Massachusetts, but I always say I got down south as fast as I could. And uh, I'm kind of a wimp when it comes to cold weather. So the uh, I, I don't blame you, my friend. So, hey, I'm, I'm super excited <laughs> to have you on here. I love talking to trainers, sales trainers and professionals who understand human behavior, who understand how to use sales techniques and principles that work with human behavior, whereas most salespeople are still being taught old school techniques that work against human behavior. So I'm excited to have you on here. Really gonna help everybody listening. So I wanted to dive into your story real quick and give our listeners just a feel for your background and how you arrived at this point where you're one of the elite authorities on sales and influence. Maybe tell us a little bit about your background and how all this started for you. Like, how did you learn all these skills? Sure. Well, I began as a broadcaster, first in radio and sports and then television news. I was actually the late night news guy for a very small ABC affiliate in the Midwestern United States. Really? Uh, was not very good, though. So it wasn't long before I, I like to say I graduated into sales. The okay. challenge, Jeremy, was I knew nothing about sales. I'd never had any formal training uh, yeah. in the company where I was working they gave me no training. So it was pretty much just me out there. And sure. hey, I, I knocked on doors, I made calls, I, you know, did all the work. Uh, yeah. I, I was what Jim Rohn, the late Jim Rohn, great 
great yeah. business philosopher would have said, I had the motivation, but not the information. Ah, right? I didn't have the right skills yet. Yeah. Right. And you have to have both. Now, just having the right information, if you don't have the right motivation, that also doesn't work. But you've got to have both. You got to have both. Yeah. Now, one day I was in a bookstore looking for something. I wasn't even sure what. And I came across a couple of books on sales. Now, this is 40 years ago. Now, that's okay. no big deal. Back then, that wasn't as prevalent. Sure. So the books were by, by Zig Ziglar and Tom Hopkins, two of the, okay. the great, sure. right, you know, the, 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 the heroes of the profession. Yeah. And I remember getting those books, and I always say I, I never read them. I devoured them. Sure. And so every night I'd come home and, and I would study until the wee hours, hours of the, uh, the morning. Mm -hmm. I would practice and I would drill and I would rehearse and I'd highlight and note take and dog ear and I'd just keep... Within a few weeks, my mm. sales began to go through the roof. Sure. Now, here's the thing. There was really no significant difference in me three weeks earlier and three yeah. weeks later, except now I had a methodology. Sure. I had a system, if you will. And to this day, I define a system mm. as the process of predictably achieving a goal yeah. based on a logical and specific set of how to principles. In other words, yeah. the key is predictability. Yeah. If it's been proven that by doing A, you'll get the desired yeah. results of B, then you know yeah. all you need to do is A and continue to do A and continue yeah. to do A. Yeah. Eventually, you'll get the desired results of B. Uh, that was a, a breakthrough for me. And so sure. I just became a sales student. A, a you man. had this breakthrough. You started selling more. What happened next? Well, I also began to uh, really get into the personal development aspect, which you know is so important because it's what we, it's how we grow on the inside that helps us manifest success on the outside. Sure. Uh, well, eventually, you, you, within a couple of years, a few years, I guess, I was sales manager of a, another company okay. and uh, I started being asked to share with other people and other companies what was working yeah. for us and, sure. and uh, eventually I just, I, I really just went into the business of yeah. teaching sales, which yeah. was great for me i just loved it because i love sales and i love teaching and i love speaking so you know sure. that worked out well so hey listen i was on your website earlier tell tell me a little bit about this go giver like selling the go giver way you talk a lot about like selling the go giver way like what do you mean by that term go giver yeah, that's a great question because it's always so important to understand the premise because that's where it all begins. Mm -hmm. uh, the the basic underlying premise, if you will, of the Go Giver is simply that shifting your focus, shifting mm -hmm. your focus from getting to giving. Now, when we say giving in this context, we yeah. simply mean constantly and consistently providing immense value to others, understanding sure. that doing so is not only a uh, nicer way of doing business, a more fulfilling sure. way of doing business. It's the most financially profitable way as well. Not for some woo-woo way out there, magical, sure. mystical type of reasons, not at all. It yeah. totally ties into, as you were saying earlier, the human nature, the way people are. Hey, let's face it. When you're that person mm -hmm. who can take your focus off yourself mm -hmm. and place it on yeah. helping others, helping them in their life, helping them accomplish what they want to accomplish, solving their problems, helping them yeah. to get to that next. People yeah. feel good about you. People want to get to know you. They like you. They trust you. They want to be in relationship with you to do business mm -hmm. with you and refer you to others. You know, Jeremy, yeah. one of the things that I say when I, when I speak at uh, sales conferences. Okay. Sure. And we haven't had those for a while now. Let, I know I had 20, I had 21 conferences from March till oh. December all canceled, but that's okay. We're I'm here. So and I, lo I, lo I yeah. love, I love, I love, I love working virtually now. I love it. Yeah, I know. It's great, isn't it? And one of the things I would do when I'd start out is, is, you know, to, to this group, this, this audience of salespeople, I'd say, nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet. Yeah. Okay. Nobody cares they're, about you. Who do right. they care about? They're not going to buy from you because you need the money. And I'll tell you, they're not even going to buy from you because you're a really nice person who believes in what you do. They're going to buy from you only because they believe that they will be better off by doing so than by not doing so. I think you so. hit it right on the head because so many people, and, and there is some truth to it, but everybody since the stone ages of selling says, well, people buy from people they like. Well, yeah, okay, that's true, right? 
but you also don't buy from a lot of people you don't like. Like if grandma's trying to sell you her latest MLM, you might really like grandma, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to buy from grandma. You said it rightly. You're buying from people who you feel can solve your problems the most and be able to get you the desired result that you want. Right. That's who you're buying from. Not necessarily somebody you just like. Yeah. And, and here's the thing too. If, if there's somebody who says, okay, Jeremy, okay, Berg, but, but, my, but I'd buy from my grandmother who was selling, a, let's say, a, a network marketing product even. Okay, you would, but here's the thing. You're still doing it for your reasons because it's, it's congruent with your values to support your grandma who you love. Yeah. But you cannot make a living You can't thinking make a living. That's that a any, hobby. hobby. Right, e e exactly. And so- yeah, I love, I love, we're, we're speaking the same language, my friend. Now, now this is really, good though, and it's, uh, but it's great for the yeah. salesperson, the entrepreneur, Jeremy, who can genuinely focus on that other person. Yeah. They create that environment, that what I call benevolent context for yeah. success because that other person knows mm -hmm. that you're focused on them, that your desire is to discover what they want, what exactly. they need. Instead of you focusing on the expectations of making the sale, you're instead focused on whether or not you can actually help the person. Ah, that ah, exactly. comes out, right? So instead of the prospect feeling like, oh, this is just another salesperson trying to stuff your solution down their throat, they view you more as the, as the trusted authority, as I exactly. call it, the advisor, the trusted authority, who's there to help them solve their problems and get them the result they want. Now, I want to talk about this. I love the book. Can you briefly take us through, and there's a lot here, we'd probably be on here for five hours, but <laughs> briefly take us through the five laws of the go-giver way so we understand. Sure, uh, the five laws are the laws of value, compensation, influence, authenticity, and receptivity. The mm. first one is the law of value. This says your true worth, in the business sense of course, your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value yeah. than you take in payment. Now when you first hear this, sure. Sounds a little counterintuitive. Give more in value than I take in payment. That sounds all nicey nice and everything, but it yeah. also sounds like a recipe for bankruptcy. Exactly. So we have to understand the difference between price and value. Mm. Uh, price is a dollar figure. It's a, a dollar amount. It's finite. Mm. It simply is what it is. Mm -hmm. Value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing, of yeah. something to yeah. the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea, what have you, that mm -hmm. brings so much worth or value to yeah. another human being that they will willingly, this free market, willingly choose to pay for it, exchange their money for it, and be glad they did while you make a very healthy- It's all about helping them establish the gap of where they're currently uh, at, like their current state, as some people would call it, to their desired future state, right? So if your product, let's say costs $50,000, but if they invest in your product or service for 50,000, but it's gonna gain them an extra million dollars, sure. right. well, that 50,000 looks pretty cheap, right? So if they can yeah. get the funding together, they get the desired result. If they can't get the funding together, they don't get what they want, right? right? That's course. setting that gap, not telling them, but asking them the right questions that psychologically in their mind, have themselves come to that conclusion of how big that gap is, that wide that gap is of where they are compared to where they want to be and how you can actually get them there. 100%. Keep going. I love this. Okay. So law number two is the law of compensation. Mm -hmm. And this says that your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one says to give more in value than you take in payment. Law number two tells us that the more people whose lives you touch with the exceptional value you provide, the more money with which you'll be rewarded. In the story, uh, Nicole, the CEO, advised Joe, um, the, uh, met the protege, yeah. that while law number one represents your potential income, it's mm -hmm. not enough to just bring wonderful value to one or two or three people. 
okay? Sure. Law number two is about your reach. Law number two is about how many lives you're able to impact. This is why I'm such a big believer in building a referral-based business because yeah. with referrals, it's easier to set the appointment. Sure. Price is generally less of an issue. And you know, remember, we don't wanna be selling on low price. We wanna be selling on high value. When you sell yeah. on price, you're a commodity. When you sell on value, you're a, and I love your word earlier, trusted resource. You're the trusted authority. Yeah, they're always going to come authority. to you no matter if you're double what your competitors are because they feel that you're the person that's going to get them the, that result. Exactly. The third benefit of a referred prospect is that it's easier to complete the transaction. Just yes. is. Uh, you know, that makes intuitive sense. It's what we call, um, uh, you know, that, that third party uh, credibility, right? And, yeah, and, and sure. that is someone who they trust has mm. said, you know, this is the only person you need to see, right? This is the person who's going to take care of you. This sure. is the person. And then the, uh, another great benefit of a referred prospect is they're already of the mindset that that's how you do business because that's how they met you. Okay. So law number three is the law of influence. The law of influence says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Now, yeah. Now let me clarify that and qualify that if I may too, because it can, it can easily be misunderstood. Sure. When we say place the other person's interests first, we don't mean you should be anyone's doormat or a, a right. martyr or self-sacrificial in any way. I, absolutely not at all. Sure. It's simply understanding as Joe, again, the protege in the story learned from several of the mentors, the golden rule of business of sales certainly is that all things being equal, yeah. People will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust, sure. okay? And there's simply no faster, more powerful, or more effective way of eliciting those feelings toward you and others than by genuinely moving from that I focus or me focus yeah. to that other focus, making your win all it's, about it's the, the you person. focused or at least we focused, right? You're working together as a team to solve their problem, to get them the results. I love that. Exactly. Law number four is the law of authenticity. This says the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. Um, in this part of the story, Deborah, one of the mentors explained that all the skills in the world, the sales skills, technical skills, people skills, as important as they are, and hey, you and I, we, we both would know they're very important, sure. but they're also all for naught if you don't come at it from your true authentic core. But when you do, right? When you show up as yourself day after day, week after week, month after month, people feel good about you. They feel comfortable with you. They feel safe with you because you're consistent. They know who it is they're getting. And that's very important when it comes to trust. And now people feel good. Now people trust you. Now people want to be in a relationship with you. They want to refer you to yeah. others. Yeah. And law number five is the law of receptivity. And this one says the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. This really is nothing more than understanding that, yes, we breathe out, yeah. but we also have to breathe in. It's not one or the other. We sure. breathe out carbon dioxide. We breathe in oxygen. We breathe out, which is giving of value. We yeah. breathe in, which is receiving prosperity. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we get this, these horrible, not even mixed messages, but negative messages from the world around us about prosperity, sure. about business, about money, about, well, you know, despite what we hear from the world around us, giving and receiving are not opposite concepts. They're yeah. simply two sides of the very same coin and they work in tandem. It's not, are you a giver or a receiver? No, sure. you're a giver and a receiver, but here's what that. you know, because this is again, this is the laws of nature. The giving must be the focus. The yeah. giving of value comes first, just like you don't go to a, a fireplace and say, first you give me some heat and, and fire, then I'll throw on some logs, sure. right? And light a match and, and so forth. You don't say to the, you don't open up an account at the bank and say, first give me an interest payment and then I'll make it a putt. No, the giving <laughs> comes first. This is why John David Mann, my awesome co-author, why we say that money is simply an echo of value. 
I love that. Okay. That is it's such the, a true saying. Yeah. I want to stroll right into this. You, you're, you talk a lot. So on YouTube and different places I found you, you talk a lot about the golden rule of sales. What's that all about? Yeah. So, uh, so we alluded to it a little earlier, and it's really important, I think, to understand the, the various concepts of it, because that can be confusing as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and here's what it is, that all things being equal, or even close to equal, but sure. let's say all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. Now, um, it, the, the, we, know is obvious. They either have to know of you, which is where referrals come in, or they have to know you personally. Like, as you said, important, but it's not the end all be all. We yeah. will still do business with people we don't like. I'll still allow the, uh, the heart surgeon to operate on me, even if I don't like him or her, yeah, you, if I know they're really good. You even see it in politics, right? We get the political stuff going on. A lot of people vote for people they don't necessarily like. Maybe they wouldn't hang out with that individual. Right but they feel like they're gonna get the best result from that person, right? They're exactly. not gonna hang out with them at sure. the bar or at church or whatever, but they think that they're gonna get them the desired result. Exactly. So they'll still vote for them 100%. So that's where the all things being equal at the beginning comes in. Because yeah. all things being equal, you'd rather do business with the person you like rather than the person who you don't like. But sure. then the most important part is trust. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we live in a low trust society. And then, you know, I mean, the Edelman trust barometer, which is sort of like the holy grail of, of trust barometers, um, you know, has been saying it's been going downhill for, for years. I don't think because people are any more or less trustworthy than they ever were before. I think there's just more ways of the world. Well, you're seeing a lack of trust, right? 2008, 2009, stock market, the, you know, these companies taking the last 401k out of a you know, person that's retiring that they knew was going to go down right when it crashed and they would still take the money. I mean, there's so many things, right? Just, we call it the post-trust air. Yeah. Everybody. And that, yeah. And that's also because remember the, the, um, the media, whether it's television, radio, internet, whatever it happens to be, they make their money from eyeballs. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so their headlines are what attract. Here's a here's a headline that that I guess got tested that didn't attract. Sure. Corporate CEO treats people fairly. Nobody's gonna read that. No. <laughs> and I was like, and I don't think they ever tested that one. But we hear about you know Enron, of course, and we hear about Tyco, and we hear about you know the uh, uh, what was the 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 bank Wells Fargo who you know were pre and and a Volkswagen who who with their uh, who falsified their emission. We hear about those, and they happen. They do happen, absolutely. But here's the thing, and most of those are not even operating out of a free market type of environment. There's a lot of cronyism going on there oh, that sure, that yeah. gives them an unfair advantage based yeah. on their relationships with government and all. We won't even get into that. But yeah. for most of us, for those of, who are watching this and listening to this, and you and me, okay, we work in basically a free market environment. No one is forced to buy from any of us. 100%. So the only way, the only way that you can do really, really well financially mm. is to provide immense value to the lives of many people. And you do that through developing that know, like, and trust. Yeah. And, and the trust, like you said, is so important. Like if people don't trust you, even if they like you, they're still not going to buy. The trust is yeah. the number one thing. They trust that you can get them the desired result that they want, period. Now, what's, let's talk about some of the fears salespeople have. I mean, there's a lot, right? But what's the biggest fear most salespeople have in terms of mindset, what, what do you think that is? Well, one of them is simply running out of new people to to okay. present to. Uh, okay. You know, sure. I mean, well, let's face it, sales is a a no type of business. More yeah. people tell us no than tell us yes. Sure. And if you're, you know, most people they begin with that initial list of names, mm. and uh, or they have a you know a finite territory or whatever it happens to be. And as they get a lot of no's, if they are not replenishing this, okay, uh, every time someone tells them no, they feel as though they're one step closer to being out of business, sure. you know, leading to that, that most horrible of sales questions, who do I talk to next now that my original list of names has run out? How can they overcome that fear? Well, uh, you overcome it a couple of ways. Yeah. One is, is by going out there and creating new 
prospective customers, clients, and referral sources. I mean, that is so very important. That should never stop. It gets easier as you go along, sure. but it, but that should, should never stop. Um, the other thing we also need to be able to do is that is – is when we present, when we do present to someone, yeah. we need to have enough emotional posture mm. that we don't come across as desperate or yeah. needing that other person too much. And yeah. now, you know, one of the ways to do that is by creating so many potential customers, clients, referral sources that yeah. you really don't care. If, you know, if someone says no, you're, it's very easy to say next. Well, you really um, have to become what we call a problem finder and problem solver, right? Because you always read in books that you have to be great at problem solving. Okay, well, that makes sense. You have to solve problems. But in our day and age, with trust be at, at its lowest point than probably ha than it's ever been, you now have to be even better at what we call problem finding. And that means asking the right questions to that prospect that helps them uncover challenges and problems that they didn't even know they have. One thing we all have to realize is that most prospects you talk to don't even know they have a problem, right? They just don't, right? Or maybe they know about the problem, but maybe they don't know how bad it really is. Or maybe they don't know the root cause of the problem. Or maybe they don't know if they don't do anything about it, the consequences of them not solving it, right? Because if you can't help, if you can't learn the right questions that brings out that emotion, right, from the prospect, the feeling side, right? If you can't ask the right questions that help them uncover their own problems in their mind, it's impossible for them to ever buy from you so you can ever solve the problem. So in our day and age, it's yeah. all about problem finding and then problem solving. Well, it's, uh, it's very important. And, you know, I think it's important to know your, and this assumes that, that one is working within a particular niche market where you get yeah. to really know, e even though different prospective customers and clients will have different problems in a sense, sure. if sure. you really know your, your market, yeah. you know that, they, that these problems kind of come in with, with, within a bracket in a, yeah. in a way, okay? Oh, 100%. Yeah. And so if you know your business so well and know their business so well, which is no reason not to, if yeah. you really, then you actually know more about their business than they do as it relates to how you can solve the problems solve that the problem. they don't even know they have. And that's where insight comes in. And that's one of those things that separates you from, from the competitors. All right. So I want to talk, uh, speaking of fears, I, I really wanted to ask you this. Okay. So we all know objections. Uh, continue to be really, uh, I would say the main thing that gives so many salespeople anxiety every single day, right? We all know that every single sales book I've ever read, you know, I read about three books a month. Okay. So that's 36, 36 books a year times the last 19 years, probably like you look at all those books on your <laughs> shelf. Every single sales book you've ever read supposedly teaches you how to handle objections. But if this is the case, why is this still such a problem with salespeople? Yeah, I, I think it comes down to something very basic. Mm. And, and that is typically, uh, especially if you, because let's face it, if you've been in your business for two weeks, you yeah. probably have heard just about all the objections you're going to get. Every so often, one comes from out of left field, but mm. mainly you've heard. Or if you did your company sales training, they told you what the objections would be. Right. What Going to give you a response or rebuttal, as they right. call it. Right. Okay. So what happens is you're taught or you learn these great responses that you learn, you know, word for word, you know, uh, your price is too high, oh, blah, 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 blah. It's not in the budget, blah, 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 blah. This and that, blah, 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 what have you. Okay, now you can know those perfectly. Sure. But typically an objection that is stated by a prospect mm -hmm. is not the core root the core issue it's simply the man the verbal manifestation of what's really going on in their mind what's behind that objection what's behind it so when they say you know the price is too high no it's not that the price is too high what it is is they see the price you're asking as being here and the value as being here being so something but yeah. here's the thing you can have the perfect perfect response to your price is too high, that's fine. But you're giving the perfect response to the wrong objection. Mm, and like this that. is, I think, what generally happens. Yeah. And then we get frustrated because, well, but I, I practiced these and I knew this and it just rolled right off my tongue and I was flawless. 
and sure. it still didn't work. Well, no, because it's not what's bothering them. Yeah. Well, you got, yeah, it, it, you know, we teach three rules to, to help a prospect overcome their own concerns. And that first, you have to clarify what the objection even means. Like when they say the price is too high, what does that really mean? You, you don't know what that means. Not every prospect, that doesn't mean the same thing to every prospect. I mean, so you yeah, have to absolutely. ask clarifying questions around what does that actually mean? Then you have to discuss it like two people working it out, like discussion, right? And then you have to ask what are called diffusing questions that allow them to overcome that own cons their own concern in their own mind, rather than you just giving out some flib response that's coming mm -hmm. from you and your agenda that's gonna go in one ear out the other of that prospect. It's so important. Now, you said, and I, I see you say this a lot, that there's a false statement about objections that most salespeople tend to accept as just a fact, but you say it isn't so. Elaborate that for us on that. Oh, I'm trying to think what that is now in the, in the um in the context of what we're talking about, a false statement about <laughs> so there's objections. a false statement about objections that most salespeople just tend to accept as a fact, but you say that that's not necessarily the case. I, I think what it was probably yeah. was in the context of just accepting that ah. that they're that their answer is the answer. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, just if you're accepting that their answer is just the answer and you're just going into like rebuttal mm -hmm. mode, you right. might get a sale here and there, but most people are still going to reject you. You got to yeah. get out of that mode. It, yeah. It's very difficult. You, you've got, you're taking, if you just, you know, again, re, re, as you said, rebut that, then you're taking the chance that that is actually there. And, and it, it probably- Well, you're losing trust. You're losing trust because well, it's all about you focused you showing them data and facts to try to prove your point. Whereas if they hear that, they're just going to do what? Dig their heels in even more. Yeah. Well, you bring up a great point. And that's one reason why I like to always provide an out or back door when first responding to an objection, regardless of what it is. For example, uh, you know, let's say you have a, uh, uh, a MacGuffin. Uh, I used the term MacGuffin. That's an old um, uh, Alfred Hitchcock invented that word. The great movie director. The uh, the MacGuffin yeah. is the object around which the movie revolves, sure. but it's never really the most important part. Just yeah. like our product or service is right. what the sale revolves around, but it's never the most important aspect. It's only the yeah. conduit to getting them what they really want. So yeah. you have a MacGuffin that you know that that produces uh, widgets that that yeah. th this person uses, and the person says. You know, I, I really think your your price is too high. Now, you could again, you know, you could go, you could rebut, and you could say, well, as we talked about earlier, blah, 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 it makes yeah, blah, 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 right. blah. yeah that's what average started? salespeople do. Right, exactly. But what if you started by when they say the price is too high, you say mm, that's certainly something to consider. Um, if I may ask, uh, what kind of results would you need to see in order to justify that kind of price? Now. So when we do that and we say it could be, or that's certainly it's something to control. consider, what yeah. you're doing is you're letting this person know that first of all, that's fine, that it's about them, not about you, that yeah. your goal is to help maybe them. Maybe this isn't for them. Yeah. Right. Now, by the way, and I, and I want to make sure that, that this is understood by those who are listening. When you give a person the out or back door saying either, well, that's certainly something to consider or, uh, well, it could be, uh, we should discuss that, that what you're, you're, it's not that you're increasing the chances that they're going to say, oh yeah, okay, that's right. No, you're not doing that at all. The law of the out or back door uh, simply says the bigger the out or back door you give someone to take, the less they feel the need to yeah. take it. Because exactly, because they don't feel the sales pressure from exactly. it. Exactly. feel like, oh, this person maybe is here to help rather than he's just trying to sell something. Right, so you haven't said to this person, well, yeah, you're right, it is too high. What was I thinking? And you have all these problems. <laughs> no, you're just thinking, well, it's certainly something to consider. So again, we always want to make sure this person knows we're on their side. It's not two opposing sides. It's both of us with one goal to help yeah. provide immense value to well, them. I like how you reshaped it where you got them to focus on more of the result, the results-based yeah. thinking, like what result do you want for this instead of price-based thinking. Exactly, and of course I, I compress this because it's, you know. 100%, in, in now I wanna move into closing. <laughs> closing is always a big topic, obviously with salespeople. Uh -huh. And for years, especially like in the old days of selling, Closers were the ones that companies always wanted to hire, like find me closers. I just need people to close sales for me. 
Now you're saying things are different. Tell us why. You know, it, it, it's not that you don't have to ask for the order. Sure you do. I mean, that's, that's a part of it. But it's no longer about the clothes as it used to be in the, you know, kind of the bad old days. <laughs> if you've done everything correctly, if you've done your discovery correctly, and you truly understand what they need, want, and desire, yeah. if you provided those excellent insights, as you were talking about earlier, that shows them where they have issues that you are there to solve, if you've been able to then connect the benefits of your product or service with their needs, wants, and desires, sure. if you've been able to answer questions, good questions that they have and move that, that's fine. Now the close yeah. is simply asking them to take action on something they've already told you they want to do. And more importantly, they've told themselves. And right? they've told so themselves. They're exactly. just asking a few what we call commitment questions that get them exactly. to take the next step and logically it, exactly they persuaded themselves throughout that discovery process that they have problems you have the solution to solve those problems so it's just putting two yeah because you're you're so right like in the old days of selling like the aida model of selling attention interest desire action it was like 10 percent was building relationship talking about the weather who won the game that night another 10 percent was asking a few surface level questions about their needs and then 50% was the presentation. We just talk about the features and benefits and how we have the best this, the best that. And then the last 30% was closing. And it's crazy. But I think now closing is like 5% of the process. Well, it is because it's simply the natural conclusion, okay, to everything else that you've done correct up to this point. And that's, and that's great news. Oh, it's, it's so, so much like more of a so much easier and more profitable. Yeah. It like eliminates 95% of the stress and anxiety when you exactly. learn those skills. Now, I want to jump into this. What, what's the best way to handle a situation where let's say that you're about to do a presentation and the prospect comes to the, that meeting and they're already defensive. Like you can tell by their mm. body language, you can tell by their tonality, they're already defensive before you even start. What question would you want to ask there? that would allow that prospect to open up to you and actually want to engage? What question would you want to ask that? I would want to reset their frame. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because what, you know, what is a frame? Mm -hmm. The frame, a frame is simply the foundation from which everything else proceeds mm -hmm. and occurs. Okay. Yeah. So if they come with a very much of a defensiveness and let's say it's a, uh, her name is Mary and Mary lets you know right away and there's no relationship there. You just, you met Mary through some way that wasn't a somewhere yeah. where the relationship's already built or where there's already a, a pre-trust. Okay. Um, and Mary comes to the table, just sort of letting you know, you know, she's no easy mark and she's yeah. not going to buy right now. And she just wants the facts and just wants it. Sure. Now, if you buy into that frame, yeah. okay. And you become argumentative or try to, you know, nothing, nothing good is going to happen for yeah, either. You're dead. She's not yeah. going to benefit from your product or service and you're not going to receive your fee and or, or 100%. So let's change the frame. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we want to, of course, be very non-defensive and just listen to what she says. And then we might say something like, you know, Mary, while we've been able to help a lot of people with this MacGuffin, uh, whether or not it's the right solution for you, I simply can't know. You know, we can't know without really digging deeper and finding out if it's the answer to what you need. So yeah. please know our conversation is for both of us to determine that. And if it is, great. If not, that's okay too. Yeah, you're detaching yourself, right? Up exactly. front, so it causes them to open up. Another question you can use is you can say, you know, John, I've, I've got this presentation here we can go through all that if you'd like, but I, I guess just to turn it back over to you, what would you like to discuss today so that we could focus on you and maybe what you're looking for? And you yeah. turn it back over to them, right? So it's like they're taking, they feel like they have control, mm -hmm. but now you've really taken that control back, right? Sure. And even to say, you know, even if they come up and say, well, you know, hey, you know, like the beginning of it, like, well, I'm not sure why you're even here. Like, why should we even go with you? Because that happens a lot, a lot in meetings, important, defensive. You can simply say, you can just agree, just say, I, well, to be frank, I'm not quite sure not, you should. Not be. sure we should. <laughs> yeah. Not, and, not and, sure. And, and, you know, to be frank, uh, I'd, I'd need to know a little bit more about you and kind of and your situation and what you're looking for, if anything, to see if I can even help you in the first place. Yeah. I mean, you the, say the, that people are just like, oh, 
that's the very best thing. It's so counterintuitive and so so surprising when you do. That's the best thing when someone says, I, you know, why should we go with with you? And that what that does, see the frame there is to get the salesperson to go, well, because blah, 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 and we're number one, and little, 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 little right? Get rid of you. Exactly. Yeah. So when they say, you know, why should we get, well, I don't really know yet that you should. should yet. Right? <laughs> and now, yeah, exactly. We're just resetting the frame. I love that. Yeah, you, you and me, like-minded there. Okay, so let's talk <laughs> about bad habits for a second. I know you've got to go in a second. Salespeople are known for a lot of bad habits, but there's one in particular that you say you have to turn into a strength Mm-hmm. You really want to be a top, top salesperson. What is that habit? Uh, it can, it's very simple. We, we've really been alluding to it the whole time. And I know you and I are both on the same page. Yeah. And that is realizing that the, the sale is not about you and it's not about the product. Yeah. It's oh. totally about Nobody them. gives a crap about your product or service. It, yeah. And the easiest thing, the most natural thing is to just talk about your product. And that's it, right? And all about the and and about that your company's been around for eighty years, and that, the, cares. This and that they don't care. And that's the biggest thing that a salesperson needs to turn around and and just understand it is it is great salesmanship is never about the salesperson. Right? With the the salesperson's a very important part, but it, that's not what the sale is You're about. So right. So many salespeople are trained by their companies and, and a lot of sales gurus, supposedly sales gurus, had to be what I call product pushers. And you need to go from being a product pusher, we're just talking about the features and benefits, now you have the best of this and trying to pitch them over to that side where you're viewed as more of the problem finder and problem solver, the authority, the trusted authority mm-hmm. that's focused on them and what they're looking for, right? You're, you're so right at that. Now, I wanna to talk to you about this. You said that there's a word that practically, and I, I'm big on this, a lot of words, but there's one word in particular that practically every salesperson uses that you say you just got to get rid of it, take oh. it out of your vocabulary. It's like the cardinal sin of selling. Mm-hmm. What is that word and what does it do psychologically to a prospect when you use it? Well, first, the word is pitch. Mm. And I agree. Yeah. I mean, unless you're talking about baseball or you're talking about voice or the angle of a roof, yeah, you should take the word pit or the, or a soccer field, football field over in, in the United UK so or other areas, just take yeah. the word pitch out of there. Yeah. And you know, salespeople say, yeah, but I only, I only use the word pitch when talking with other salespeople, but you know what? And, and we say, well, isn't it just semantics? Well, maybe, but sometimes semantics are very important, both in terms of what we say to others, but also in terms of what we say to ourselves. If yeah. we believe we're out there to pitch the prospect, yeah. then again, it's about us and it's about our product. If we're out there to present or share or serve or what have you, now that's a whole different thing. So I would take the word pitch and yeah. absolutely. You should never pitch. use it. None of it. <laughs> Bob, you're so right. You should never use it because when you start I mean, it's just like in Shark Tank, right? You know, the, the show where the entrepreneurs come out and try to pitch the sharks, you know, on their latest product that they want Mark Cuban to buy into or Damian John or Barber, right? Have you ever seen that show? Mm-hmm. And you notice when they pitch, do you notice the body language of the panel there? How they're like, oh, it's, it's so bad. That's how your prospects are viewing you when you do that because it's not that you're going in there and saying, oh, I'm going to pitch you. It's just your mentality of what selling exactly. even is. Selling is not pit about pitching. It's not convincing. It's not about manipulating. It's not you against the customer. It's collaborative. It's not adversarial. It's collaborative if you want to be a top performer. It's you working with them to find what their problems are, if any, because maybe they don't have problems and you're okay with that. Maybe you can help them and you're there to help them solve the problems that you help them find. And when you get good at that, it, it, nothing will hold you back. I mean, you literally will be the top salesperson in your company overnight. Your industry, you can go to any industry, be the top performer there in a few months because you understand that. You understand that selling is being of service. It's not manipulating people to buy something from you. Exactly. Exactly. I love Amen. that. Hey, all right. Uh, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. I think we could go on for a couple more hours. Do you have any final thoughts or advice for our listeners? You know, it's funny. I'm, I was just listening to what you were saying. And I, I love people like you who are really... Um, ambassadors for sales sure. because it's such a great profession. 
Yeah. And it's the, you know, sales is really the motor of the free market, free enterprise system. Yeah. And, you know, we need people doing it the right sure. way. Yeah. And I think about the old English root of the word sell, which was yeah. salan, yeah. which literally meant to give. Yeah. So when you're selling, you're literally giving. giving. And someone would say, well, again, is that semantics? Yeah. I don't think it is in this case. And I'll tell you why. Because when you have someone in front of you, yeah. you are in the you're in the selling context. What exactly, when you're selling, what exactly are you giving? Yeah. I suggest you're giving time, yeah. attention, yeah. counsel, mm -hmm. education, mm -hmm. empathy, and yeah. most of all, extraordinary value. Yeah. And if you're doing that, you're selling and you should be proud of it. Yeah. And you're going to get paid a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what, uh, what industry you're in. You literally can write your own ticket and go anywhere in the world once you learn the skills that you brought up today, 100%. Now, Bob, uh, just curious, because I want everybody to get involved with what you do. Where can our listeners learn more about you and your training? Uh, best place to go is Berg, B-U-R-G dot com. There are a bunch of resources there, including the books where you can um, get chapter one and see if you like it first and then always click through if you'd, you'd like to. We also have on that page a uh, free um, four video mini course called uh, that's Selling. Where I, I want them to go to that. Where yeah, selling the go-giver way, uh, okay. which is also they could get there by going to thegogiver.com slash selling. Okay. But if they go to Berg.com, it should pop up and there, there should be a little okay, so thing. That's B, a link they can click. B is in boy, URG.com. Yeah. That's going to pop up. They can just opt into that to get some like mm -hmm. training to become familiar with some of these skills. Yeah. And it's four videos of, of action, you know, of, uh, right. of how to. Absolutely. Okay. I love that. All right. I want everybody to go that when you hear me. So go to Berg.com. Opt into that free uh, three, um, four, you know, four video training. Really going to help you out, Bob. You just hit the surface today of what salespeople really should be learning in that, you know, forty-five minutes or so that we have. Wish we could stand here for five hours with you. We're going to have to have you back on because you you I brought the it. heat today and really helped people <laughs> go out today and like do some of these things you just talked about. Some of this tactical training, I love that. So thanks for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I love the work you're doing. Thank you. Now, if you're serious about joining the top 1%, I mean the top 1%, and you want to experience more training content just like this, click the links right over there. Right over there, they're exactly what you need to see next. You see, I release new episodes featuring top salespeople and sales authorities, multiple six-figure, high six-figure, even seven figure earners every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, every single week at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And if you're new here, do yourself a favor and smash that subscribe button right below, right below, and join our new Facebook group, Sales Revolution. You see, it's free, and there's a link in the description below just for you. We put it there for you. Finally, I make posts on Facebook and Instagram each and every day with more tips and training. So be sure and follow me and turn on your notifications. So make a comment in the first seven minutes to any of my latest posts, share this episode, and there's a very real chance that you're gonna win some killer prizes. And here's the thing, don't sit on the sidelines. Don't be like everyone else, get into the game. Join the sales revolution, stay active, get involved, learn the right skills, and we will show you how to take your life and income to a level that most only dream about. Stay safe. Talk to you soon.